Uh, I think most of you guys know who I am. I'm Marie. If you don't know who Stacy is, Stacy is an amazing instructional designer. Um, she is the one that I went to when I needed to take my course to the next level. Um, so Stacy, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the group. I, I just respect your work so much. You've been a huge, huge help to me on the course development side. So I would love for you to say hello to the group. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm thrilled to be here and uh, help out. So I'm Stacy Howlott. I'm an instructional designer by trade. I have a master's in education and spent my career working in the Fortune 500 companies. And then uh, I guess 10 years ago, I left uh, the workforce and came home to start a family. And I started my own business and uh, teaching. So I uh, both now uh, teach students and then I also do uh, ID consulting for um, online entrepreneurs to help them create the best learning that they can. And I've known Marie for years, I think. Um, and I was just, I've, I've been so excited about Doki and I refer my clients to Doki. And I was just thrilled for the opportunity to uh, hang out with y'all this summer and see how I can help. Yeah, thank you so much, Stacey. Um, we had Stacey log in to Oki sort of back in the day when we were first building it and kind of give her two cents. And, um, you know, we thought we were solving the hardest part of course creation. Like, look, we've figured out all the tech. Um, everything else is easy. And what we noticed was uh, people were setting up their accounts and then they were on it for maybe six months and they hadn't launched a course yet. And we were wondering, what's happening here? We have so many people that have accounts that haven't actually launched yet. And so as we started to talk to more people, we had people saying, um, oh, I just, I didn't realize how much work it was going to be. I'm not quite ready yet. Um, that imposter complex would start creeping in. And so it was just kind of a shame to see so many people who have amazing ideas, but didn't know how to execute. And, you know, a lot of us haven't gone to teachers college. We don't necessarily know some of the core tenants, like how do you create a course that engages people? Um, as you know, Stacy knows because she saw the very first version of my course, Digital Strategy School, that it was a fire hose of information. That there was so much information, um, and as I, you know, I heard feedback, and if Connie is in, in the group too, Connie's um, a participant of Digital Strategy School. Uh, it, the common feedback was, it's awesome, and oh my gosh, it's so much work. It's oh. it's a bit overwhelming, right? And so, um, you know one thing I want to do now um, is just make the information way more accessible, way more actionable and help you guys do the same for your courses. And so uh, I just encourage you guys to kind of, you know, take advantage of Stacy's insights and, and feedback as we go through this. Um, Stacy is helping me edit the course, uh, run your learning launch. And, um, you know, she's here to contribute and, and just provide feedback as we go along through this process. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. We have a really cool range of people in um, in this group as well. If you guys could type in the sidebar what your course idea is, um, just to give us a, a sense. But I'll, I'll read you guys um, what you guys submitted in your uh, questionnaires. I think, Carlene, I don't have your questionnaire. So um, I think you're the only one whose course I'm not sure what your topic is. Uh, but so we have Helen doing brand voice and copywriting. We have Connie doing SEO for yoga studios. Um, Emmy has a business course called Changemaker. Dr. Barbara has a course to help authors write um, accurate historical fiction. Susan is doing emotional intelligence at work. Uh, Candy is doing a course for interior designers. And we have uh, Carly, and I'd love for you to type in what your, your course is as well. Supporting healthy and productive workplaces in companies experiencing change. Love it. Um, and when I asked some people what, you know, what were some of the things that held them back, we had combined imposter complex, focus and time, creative exhaustion, too much client work, um, not knowing how to get the ideal client, you know, how do you actually get people into your course, uh, being too vague, right? So when you have an offering that's too vague, you don't know how to connect it to your ideal learners. So those are some of the things that popped up in the questionnaire that we sent out. Um, so I would love to give you guys a bit of a chance to, um, you know, bring it up on screen as well and maybe dive into some of your uh, course blueprints. Hopefully you guys have had a chance to fill those out. Some of you have shared them with me and I've loved kind of seeing what your guys, um, what your, your course concept looks like. Um, and I'd love to know too, if in filling out the blueprint, uh, did anything come up for you guys? Did you find any of that challenging? I'd love to know, you know, how long did it take you to, to work through your blueprint and uh, what came up for you? 
One thing I did notice is a lot of people were really, really vague with their course goals, which is fine. I know the blueprint is just kind of a starting point for you guys, but I would love for you guys to get a little bit more specific about what you want your course to do for you guys. Um, is it replace 20% of your income? You know, is it, is it, I want to make $10,000 a year with my course. I want to make $50,000 a year with your course. Whatever that looks like for you, I would love for you guys to get a little more specific. And you don't necessarily have to share it with the group, but uh, just to get specific for yourself about what you want your course to do, because that's going to help you make some really, really specific uh, goals in terms of um, how much effort you're going to have to put in into filling up your course. Ideal goals feel really lofty at this juncture. Yeah. Um, Dr. Barbara says, filling up the blueprint made me realize I can probably pull this off in four weeks or so. That's great. <laughs> Why did I wait so long? Yeah, and that's um, that's the thing too. And I'm guilty of this. And and you know, Stacy, I'm sure you you've seen this with a lot of course creators. The idea just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we don't know how to simplify. And um, how do we figure out you know what is the minimum that we need to create to get our learner from point A to point B. And I think it's, uh, we talked about this yesterday, Stacey and I, that expert head, like we are experts and we have a really hard time remembering what it's like to not have that expertise. So I think that's, I mean, you must see that all the time, Stacey. We're, um, mm -hmm. and that example with the guitar, I'd love for you to, to talk about that. Right, there's a um, there's a link, uh, I, I sent it to you right here, hang on, let me share it with everybody. Let me pull it out of my uh, sent mail. Um, oh, I didn't send it to you. Hang on. I, I sent it to you when we were in Skype, so I got to find it. I, think I, uh, um, I need to find it here. Um, so there's a great article in Harvard Business Review that I'll look for in a second and post up that y'all can read. And it talks about um, the curse of the expert, which I know we've all heard of, uh, but but it's still when it comes down to how we handle it in practice is, it is I think, a different thing. So roughly speaking what the article talks about is it had two groups of expert guitar players and it asked the first group to uh, think of questions that beginners might want to know and then answer those questions and then it took a second group and it asked those guitar players to play the guitar with their backwards hand with their non-dominant hand um, to, to do that for like half an hour and then they asked the same questions what are common questions beginners might have? And then what are your answers to those questions? And then they went to a group of beginners and said, what are your questions? So what was so interesting is they found that the group that had uh, struggled, had turned their guitar upside down and worked with their backwards hand, um, that that group was much more accurate in predicting what questions the beginners might have. And they were much more accurate in uh, providing concrete answers. For example, the expert group that hadn't practiced with their guitar uh, backwards said things like, um, oh, they, you know, they need to know how to do a chord change. So you should, you know, focus on some technical aspect of that. They were really high level in general. And the group that had been beginners uh, said, oh, well, when you're, when you're working on a chord change, move your finger a quarter inch to the left and press down harder or whatever the details were. The point is they were very tactical in their feedback and the, and then the beginners voted on whose feedback they preferred. It was a blind study. So they didn't, they didn't know which group had given what feedback, but it turned out the beginners really liked the beginner group feedback of those of those experts who had struggled with playing their guitar backwards so that's a ter it, so so i will send it to you because they do a much better way of explaining it than i did but the point of it is when you come to something with an expert mind it doesn't work that we know so much and we're, we're so expert in our fields that we mispredict what our learners need and then even if we know what our learners need, when we give our explanation, it's not at the level that they need. So sometimes I, I make an analogy that, you know, if we're the experts, we're the giants in the field, and you look down and see these pebbles at your feet, and you're like, oh, they're no big deal, they're just pebbles. But our learners are like those ants on the road, looking at those pebbles to us, but there's these huge boulders to the ants. 
So I think it's really imperative that we really change our perspective and uh, get and start listening to our learners and start uh, really trying to put ourselves in the position of not our own heads as the expert heads, but in the position of the learners. And let me go and Marie, I'll go and see if I can find that and I'll, I'll put it up here. I posted, I posted two links. I wasn't sure if one of those two was the one that you mentioned. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, the HBS one. Perfect. Yeah, the Harvard Business Review one. Yeah, the first one you posted. Great article. Perfect. I love that analogy. Um, you just, you can't escape talking to your learners, right? You just, I think it's, um, it's funny that it's one of the hardest things to do. We almost feel like we should, um, you know, create this beautiful thing in secret and go, it's all perfect and it's ready for you. Um, and we don't want to have those conversations because they might feel a bit awkward for some reason. But the more you guys can get in front and talk to people and um, it doesn't even have to be, I have a course and so I'm, I want your input or feedback. It's more just having conversations with people and um, just being willing to interview people, observe people in the wild, uh, creep on people in Facebook groups. I think Facebook groups provide such a great way to get insight. Um, yeah, so I, I just love that analogy. Um, let's see, Emmy says, uh, her course is the change maker for small business owners who are ready to take their business to the next level through structure systems and strategy. She's run it three times now, one beta, two full programs. I wanna transfer that. Uh, to Doki and add a new course, which is less hands-on. That's great. Um, and I know I know Helen uh, was talking about this too, this idea of wanting to, to only run a really hands-on course. Uh, but I think there's so much opportunity to, um, once you put that material together, that you can have different versions or different tiers of your course. And so, um, and Stacey, you know, you might have opinions on this as well, but, you know, taking what you've done, creating an evergreen version, I think, of course, you're not really going to get the same results with an evergreen version, but I think that's okay because um, it gives people kind of an introductory way of working with you, maybe at a lower price point, and it kind of gets them introduced to the things you believe in, your values, your knowledge, um, and it, those people may end up upgrading and, and purchasing coaching from you. So I don't know if you have opinions on that sort of evergreen courses versus courses that have a bit of hands-on contact. I do. I've got a couple opinions on that. Um, so I think it's interesting right now that, that we're talking like kind of what's going on in the industry right now. They're talking about course fatigue, um, mm -hmm. that, that especially with online entrepreneurs, uh, online entrepreneurs, we've taken a ton of courses and, you know, oh, my God, I don't need another course. Um, so so really looking at what really drives change. Um, and yes, you can do it in an online course and yes, you can do it in a canned online course, but is there another way to drive, drive change? Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so, uh, I, I, and I agree. I think there's absolutely in your business model, a plan for an evergreen course. And I think Marie, you're an amazing example of that, that your business really took off and you were able to, uh, really expand when you got that canned course. And, and I know you're running it some live, but then you're running it some canned. Um, so what I recommend is first creating the live version of the course yeah. to get your feet wet, because that gives you live feedback from participants. And then you're really able to see what works and what doesn't work and make changes. Um, and so then I recommend off of your live one, you know, revise it, run it again, and then you're ready to turn it into an evergreen because uh, you'll know what's working, what's not working. You'll have a sense of size. Like often some of my clients will run their flagship course live and then run different modules of it as evergreen. Um, so again, uh, with that insight, they'll say, they'll know like modules two and seven really are perfect and don't need a whole lot of hands-on feedback. So they'll run those as evergreen, um, or some of them will also like you, you have a, a tier that, that runs evergreen. Um, so there's a bunch of ways to do it, but I think you should start out doing it live because the feedback that you get is so amazing. Um, and really, really useful to help to really show you what you need to do to create a powerful standalone course. Love that. Exactly. So um, I know Helen was was curious about this uh, and really wanted that high touch environment. And I think that makes so much sense for her. Um, and so, Helen, I would say maybe maybe you don't need to decide that until after you've run the first version and run it through with the group. And then you can decide, you know, is there a version here that can be done as evergreen? Yes. So 
Because, yeah, absolutely. And then, and thank you, Susan, for that question. Um, the idea of live, I don't mean necessarily live in person, though that may be part of it. I meant just live in real time, like this example, that part of the coursework is is online uh, through Doki and is asynchronous, but part of it like this is synchronous where we're doing it in real time. So running, um, so, and often what my, how, what my clients do is we put up the materials online um, and then we run live calls um, off of it. Uh, and so, and then have a live Facebook group. So there, so you're interacting with your participants, you know, several times a week on the calls, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, but not running it just canned with no opportunity for feedback back and forth. Because what I really think what drives transformation is interaction and feedback. Um, that yes, we can read Marie's stuff and it's good. You know Marie, right? She's got really good, useful stuff. And we can you know, work on our course blueprint. But without that feedback, it makes it it makes it a lot harder. So I think running it live is this awesome opportunity to provide feedback. Um, and I think that's really where teaching happens in that back and forth between learner and, and teacher. So great. I love that. I'll just read a couple more comments from the sidebar. Uh, so Emmy said she filled out the blueprint for the second new program. And her goals are provide a shorter, more DIY, lower cost way to help um, help more people. That's great. Uh, provide a supplementary income to the baseline income I'm generating through one-on-one -on -one work. And uh, that's pretty mm -hmm. common too. I think a lot of people are hoping to kind of uh, reduce some of their client work and increase a little bit more of the, I dare I say, passive income. Courses are never passive, <laughs> but just create a, a little bit more leveraged income. So that's great. Um, and Emmy as well, uh, feel free to share your blueprint with me. Um, anyone that hasn't shared it with me, feel free to share. I'm happy to give feedback on the blueprints. Um, also, and Dr. Susan appreciates the piece on the expertise. I think we can all benefit from that article. I think, um, I think we all suffer from the curse of the expert and we have trouble valuing what it is that just comes so easy to us. Um, and another thing too about on the blueprint, um, the unfair advantage, I think a lot of people underestimate some of the things that kind of bring your unique perspective into play. Um, no one else has the type of education that you have, the, the mentors that you've had, the network you have. I think we underestimate how much that actually contributes to our own unique perspective. Um, and this is something that I learned at uh, MicroConf a really great conference. Uh, I never really considered how your your network is an unfair advantage because it's something no one else can copy. Nobody else can mimic those connections that you have with other people. So I never really thought about that as a strategic advantage. So that's something to consider. Who are you connected to? Who have who has been your your major influencers? What kind of uh, education have you taken? Even if it feels um, not directly related to what you're doing, everything is influencing the lens through which you see things. So. Um, we've all got uh, some some interesting, unique perspectives to bring there that I know a lot of you maybe haven't really tapped into when, when you were writing your your unfair advantage. I think it's hard for us to see it in ourselves, uh, and that's why. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. If I could add on to your point, Marie, that yes, that I think um, I, I think we're blind to our own brilliance to an extent, and that what your learners need from you it, is going to catch you off guard because I think we all come in teaching. Mm -hmm saying, you know, I've got all, I'm going to teach this. I've got this expertise and this is what I'm going to tell people. Like for me, you know, I, I read cognitive uh, brain journals. Like, I, like that's the, the, the actual physical thing of how people learn is amazing. I've got, you know, an entire bookshelf on learning. Now my clients don't care at all about that, right? That, that, but that's the part that I want to talk about, but nobody cares about that. I, I mean, except me um, <laughs> and, and it underlies my work and I think it makes me better. But what I'm always caught off guard by is that they just want this little teeny piece that, that this little teeny piece will totally transform this business. And I think it's the same for your learners. Um, and, and don't be intimidated by thinking, I need to build this massive thing and transfer all of my expertise. Actually, I think, at least when I work with people, they're, they're mostly caught off guard by how small the piece of the knowledge is that we're transferring, but yet how valuable and amazing and wonderful it is for their learners. So, so I think your course is gonna be smaller than you think it is, and not smaller in effectiveness, right? Not smaller in impact, 
but just smaller in, in content. Absolutely. And I, you know, I absolutely made this mistake with digital strategy school. Um, you know, it, the course that I built was so different than the course that I thought I needed to build. Um, and the very first thing I did actually was started a Facebook group. So I had invited people to this, you know, beta concept that I had well before I had created any actual content. And I'm so glad that I did uh, because I was thinking that the material just needed to be so much more advanced than it really was. So it was kind of a relief to talk to people and just say, oh, okay, like it doesn't actually need to be level 301. I can start at the 101. So. Yes. And, and I, you know, I don't have time or brain space for 301, right? I'm like, oh my God, I've got this need and, and I don't even want 101. Like I just want the piece that's going to move me forward. And, and I don't care what it is or like, so I think we all make this difference if we try to do too much in the kitchen yeah. sink and really your your learners have this very specific need and if you could just help them move one step forward that would be amazingly valuable to them and, and I still need to get that link from your talk Stacy but that concept of um, uh, what was the what was the one sentence that you asked it was like what does your learner need to know right now in this moment or what was the question that you asked that's like so obvious and so to simplify um, oh, th that i think when we stand in i think and i mean i, I won't want to speak for anyone else i'll speak for me when i go to create a course i'm like oh what do i want to talk about today what do i want to share right so i'm standing in what i know and standing in my own expertise and you know there's a lot of stuff in my own expertise as there is your all's expertise it's this huge circle right of all the things that we know but when you think instead about the question isn't what do you want to teach what do you want your course to be what's your expertise those are completely the wrong questions the question is what does your learner want to do not what does your learner want to know but what does your learner want to accomplish what are they stuck in right now that they would just give anything to step forward and be able to accomplish x that's what your course needs to hit so if you can, when you look at your course outline, if you can keep focusing on what does my learner want to do, what actions does my learner want to do, and then tailor all your course and your information in your course to serve the actions that your learner wants to take. I think that'll help us all make better courses, me included. I, I learned so much from, from my call with you, Stacey. Um, I don't know if it was last year, but just you know, my original topics were like money proposal. And now it's, you know, how to sell your services. Like they're, they're very action focused now. And so I think um, even if, as you think about your modules, if you're thinking as in every module as an action, what should someone be able to do by the end of this module? You might want to think about writing your modules as actions as well. Or is it a verb? Is it a, you know, understand your learners? That's, it's a verb. It's, it's a, an action. It's a thing I want you guys to be able to do by the end of that module. So I think that's, it's a, such a simple reframe, but it really changes the way you'll think about your content. And it's less about that information dump and it's more about let's get you integrating let's get you taking action absolutely and how i work with my clients to as we structure their course blueprint um that it, it's all action driven what what do you want your clients to do at the end of the course and then what steps do they need to do in order to accomplish those ends and then yeah it's all action and so then if there's any information it's under that action piece they need to log into mailchimp and write a newsletter okay great what do they need to do they need to they need to you know they need to know how to log into their mailchimp account they need to know how to create a broadcast right but, but those are very specific knowledge steps that are feeding that action step um and yeah the more i think we focus on action um and really it's good news for us as course creators because it takes that it, it's that filter that we can really um, cut out 90% of the work that we were planning on doing so and 90% of the information and 90% of the blog posts and 90% of videos. I mean, it really can cut out so much work and effort on your part to really just narrow in on the piece that's going to make the difference. If you follow the Pareto principle, same idea here, we're really looking at what's the 20% of the actions that are going to drive 80% of the results. 
And you know, it's it's great to know that you don't need to create a hundred percent of your course. Like you really, it, it, it turns out, and I, I don't know how to measure this, but when I informally ask uh, people to say, you know, really looking, looking back at what you thought you were gonna create and then looking at what we actually created you know, does the 80 20 hold? And for the most part, they say, yeah, I, I really am just doing a fraction of what I thought I was going to do. But yet, you know, that's driving the results that I want them to get. Absolutely. And again, we've all done, hopefully most of us have done, you know, some kind of online courses and we've, we've sort of felt overwhelmed. And um, there's many times where I think a course could have gotten to the, the meat of something in way less, right? Like 20% of the information that was there. So you're like respecting your learner when you kind of get to the point and, and you tap into the action quicker. Um, yeah, there's no need, no need to overwhelm. So uh, we'll just tap into some of the questions in the sidebar, uh, scrolling back up. Dr. Susan was asking a question for you. So with a topic like emotional balance at work um, during change, am I off base with seeing this as a topic that will always need a person to moderate, facilitate, check in versus a purely self-driven course without a real live person facilitating? Um, and that's that's really interesting for, for Dr. Susan too, because I almost wondered if hers was... Um, not exactly a course, but sort of a, a training, like a corporate training program. And are you training the people who are facilitating this information with their own teams? So are you providing exercise ideas, you know, um, video training for the facilitators that then they could go off and kind of run the exercises on their own? Like that might be one way to, to look at the potential, um, that's a great idea and i think um i think i think that that having a person can deliver the best value um so i love the idea that you're thinking of maybe always having a facilitator here um like danielle laporte's uh soul sessions and and, and desire map sessions that she has figured out hmm to really do the work and uncover the richness of the work we need to have groups and do it live and so i need facilitators so she has her whole business model around that um but i also you know and we've all read books, right? You've all read a book that has totally transformed your life. Surely I'm not the only one there, right? <laughs> you read something or journaled um, like Julia Cameron's morning pages, right? That you're like, wow, like that is so fundamentally changed my life. That was amazing. So I think there is room as well for insightful exercises, um, but it puts more effort. It puts, it puts more load on the learner and it's, um, fewer learners will um, will complete that, um, you know. But 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 I think there might be a nice mix between uh, doing facilitated ones and then doing maybe a piece of it that's that you that you could purchase that's not facilitated at all. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Emmy was just asking too if you could uh, maybe share some of your favorite books after the session. I will. I will. I've got. <laughs> I've got a whole list. So I will. Some of my favorite, um, really accessible, uh, great books to read that are not, you know, medical jargon type stuff, but really awesome. fun, great books that can really help your perspective. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I've got probably ten that that I'll recommend. Oh, amazing. Uh, and yeah, feel free to post them in the in the sidebar chat. Um, Let's see, Dr. Barbara saying for the Doki resource, I want to create, I can totally email 1800 people from my extended network and ask for introductions. That's amazing. That's a great pool of people to uh, tap into. Um, actionable over info. That's what I need to work on. That's what Connie says. Awesome. And I see Helen's note. How do you figure out which fraction? That is the million dollar question right? <laughs> of figuring out of all the things I could talk about, which are the ones that are going to drive the biggest change. And I think talking to your learners will start uncovering insights for that. And one of the reasons, well, there's so many reasons to love Marie, but one of the ones that I fell in love with is she was saying, you know, I really want to help people launch a beta. Right. She's not saying I want to help people create their signature killer end all be all course. And there's certainly room for that. Yeah. But, you know, let's not try and get to the plate and hit a home run. Like, let's go to the plate and hit a base hit, which is perfect, <laughs> because the other answer, Helen, is when you run your beta, 
you'll start, so you do your very best, yes, beforehand, and then the beta starts uncovering stuff. And at the end of your beta, you're usually you're crystal clear on, you know what? This is the half that's important. I didn't think it was going to be that. And this exercise, wow, I thought it was a throwaway, last minute thing, but that was their favorite exercise. And usually it's the thing that I slaved over for for 10 hours. Nobody cared about that one. So I'm going to toss that one out next time. And wow, you know, module four, not relevant here. I'm getting rid of it entirely. And and I'm adding entirely new module because it's going in this different direction. So it's only by being on the ground running it that you'll, that, that, it, it, not only, but being on the ground running it, really can, you can see what's really working and not working and make changes as you go. Because I'm sure, I'm sure, Marie, did that happen with um, Digital Sales School as well? Um, Sorry, wrong name for it. Digital, <laughs> digital Strategy Sorry. School. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, again, I started with the, the, Facebook page and just the questions that were coming through in the Facebook page were so different and actually somewhat unrelated to where I thought the course was going. So I started to second guess and go, oh, well, maybe I shouldn't be focusing on this. I should focus on this over here. And as you know, now, like it's going through a brand new iteration I'm breaking it up into two courses and, and having like the business foundation side. And then the digital strategy is more like a resource library. So all of that stuff came from the feedback that I was getting from people and just realizing they needed this over here and this stuff over here, they're using it differently than I expected, or, or it's like a library that they can go back to and reference, but it, it's not like a specific training. And so um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but just that. Yeah, the, the, um, you, and you didn't know that heading in. You, there's no way you could have known that heading in, right? The, oh, the only way you figured that out was running it and in the process of it, you're like, wow, they're, they're saying these things are important and these yeah. things aren't important. Jumping into so, sharks. <laughs> Right. So, so you, you, so Helen, to wrap that up, you do your very best guess by interviewing people and really listening and running a beta with people and seeing which parts of the betas are most effective and which parts are least effective for people and then making changes. Um, and Hel Helen was just saying, I think I'm having a translation error in my brain. I'm used to teaching this in person. I get amazing feedback from the in-person work, but it's too much for an online program, I think. Uh, Helen, do you mean you feel like the, there's too much content, there's too much to work with, and that you want to simplify it for your online program? Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's like the online course doesn't need to be the same as the in-person one. Like maybe it's even just one piece, one module, one exercise, um, and and, you know, from my own experience as well, um, I built the thing module by module kind of with that user feedback the whole way. So I had a rough outline of kind of what I thought it needed to be, but only once I was sort of in there doing one-on-one -on -one calls with people in the Facebook group was I crafting it as I went and realizing, oh, that actually needs to be this um, and allowing it to evolve kind of on the fly, which can be super scary, right? Like uh, we all feel like we need to have it all kind of buttoned down and and nailed down. Um, but I, I think it's important to have a structured outline and concept and direction and sort of knowing your learning goals. But I don't think you need to have every single piece figured out. I think the sooner that you can get in front of people, just having really open conversations with without an agenda, right? Like if you could have an interview with, a, with an ideal learner without an agenda for, I wanna sell them at the end of this, like take that off the table and just be willing to have that conversation with them. And I think you can you can learn so much. Uh, if I was gonna ask a question of HR managers and business leaders, is this one helpful? What one skill do you wish people in your organization had around their emotions during change or some other ideal question? What one skill do you wish people had? Um, my, so uh, my uh, gut response to that is, uh, what pro I think the question I would ask is what problems are they having? Um, like what, how are the problems showing up? And then, uh, what, like? yeah. what, yeah, what do the problems look like? And then, then working with them to kind of unpack maybe some reasons underneath that problem that, um, um, hang on, let me see, read again. What one skill do you wish people in your organization had around emotions during change? Um, yeah, I'd approach it through the problems. Like wh why, you know, when, when you unveil the new system in the workplace and people didn't adapt to it, what happened? What did that look like? Um, and then posing the question, would having emotional 
you know, would, would handle, how, how could we handle their emotions differently? Or from your perspective, what would make it easier to, to handle that switch? Yeah, I think uh, not asking those yes or no questions and not asking leading questions. So because you want to do something around emotions during change, it, that might actually be a bit of a leading question. But I think tapping in more to like, tell me about the experience of your organization going through this change. What was the employee's experience or something that can be a little bit more open ended where you get them to like, tell me about a time when those questions can actually kind of lead in interesting places and uh, problems might pop up that you hadn't really considered. That's why I'm at. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I think there might be a way to reword it slightly so it's not um, not so leading, uh, if, if possible. And I can find more examples of, of the discussion guides. I don't know if you guys had a chance to check out. Um, there is a discussion guide example in Understand Your Learners um, that should help you guys. I know the, the interview process can be really intimidating. I feel like most of my clients do get really nervous and struggle with it, this idea of some kind of formal interview. And I don't think it needs to be formal at all. Um, it could be as simple as, you know, uh, sending an email to someone and just being like, hey, I know that this is a thing that you've mentioned. Would you mind, you know, if I could just pick your ear for, for 10 minutes or 15 minutes, would you be open to that? And just treating it more like a conversation, having, you know, some of your questions preset in advance, but just being uh, open to it doesn't have to be this really, really formal process. I agree. It's like if you're going out, you're taking your girlfriend out for a cup of coffee, right? It's like, okay, you know, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this thing in my business and I would really love your perspective on it because I know you're, you know, I know what you're up to in your business and I just would really love to hear more about that. So let me, let's go out for a cup of coffee and just have a half hour chat. And yeah, and you're just listening. Um, I, my, my, I work with my people don't tend to be where I'm physically located, but we do that via Skype or via Zoom um, where we just sit down and I just listen and they can tell me like really what they're struggling with. And, and those interviews are gold. They're gold. Um, I, you know, buy people a cup of coffee or I send them a Starbucks card, the equivalent of, you know, having a cup of coffee together, um, because what they say is just so good that, that they'll unlock places that you never thought of they'll identify opportunities that you weren't aware of and their wording can go oh, yeah. straight onto your marketing page for the course i was just gonna you know, say i was so <laughs> i didn't I, I wanted to run my business my design business and i just didn't know where to start right i'm sure people have said that to you marie and if you marie's i mean you've seen marie's landing page right it's amazing and everyone her audience reads it and completely resonates with it well, Marie didn't invent all those things that she wrote. She knew that's what people were saying. Yeah. So these interviews, in addition to being really useful from a learning perspective, you can also repurpose them to a marketing perspective as well. Um, and bait and how I run my betas, I, I mean, I usually charge something for them, but I'm telling you, I would pay hundreds of dollars to people <laughs> for them to take my beta exactly. because what you get back is so worthwhile. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, touching on that too, just that you're setting the expectations of that beta and just saying, um, hey, I'm giving you access to this for free or whatever in exchange for, I would really love your honest insights and feedback. Here's what I expect of you. Um, just making sure that people know that you're expecting them to show up and what you want in exchange for that. So. Yes, and it and and I think there's a place for some people to run free betas, and I think other people should run low cost betas. And I've got a client who's running a low cost, I think, seven hundred dollar beta, but it makes sense, and that that is a that for her audience and her price point, that's a low cost beta. Now, for the rest of us, that's not a low cost beta. Yeah. Um, so 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 I I imagine some of you it will make sense to run a free beta, and for some of you it will make sense to run a paid beta, and those numbers may differ depending on your businesses and your audience, but it, they'll, you all have a low cost beta, whatever that might look like for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we can, we can dive into that too. And one of the future calls, if as you guys are, I know some of you mentioned that pricing was definitely a struggle. Um, so that's something that we can dive in on a case by case basis, because I don't think um, that'll be the same across the board. For some people, like you said, it will make sense to go free. For others, um, it may require a bit of that financial commitment. People obviously do 
commit differently when they're invested, right? And they're putting their money down and they have to part with their uh, cold, hard cash. So it, it creates a, a slightly different dynamic when people are, are putting their money down. Yeah. And in general, I tell people to charge for their betas and sometimes they do 20 bucks, sometimes they do 99, sometimes they do 700, right? Because, and I'm certainly guilty of this, right? I'm like, sure, I'll review your beta, no problem. So I put it at the bottom of my to-do list and I just never get to it because paying work comes before that. Absolutely. So, so I have, you know, not reviewed stuff when I said that I would, because it just, it's like, yeah, when I have free time and mysteriously free time, just never. <laughs> so I think getting your audience to have skin in the game. And also um, along with that, I usually, um, I usually have very targeted people I want in my betas. Um, so, so even if I'm running a paid beta, I may reach out to a handful of people and offer them a comped beta because I so want their perspective. Yep. So even if you charge, it doesn't, you know, you, you still have variations within that. Um, can I address Helen's question? For sure. Yeah, what do you need if you start talking to people and they're like, yeah, I, I, I don't want a course on that at all. I, like, these are my issues. That's brilliant. Really, That's so good to know. <laughs> I know, really, really good question because I still keep wanting to do my, you know, cognitive science theory course and nobody's interested. Um, so, so you, um, so there's two things. You could be talking to the wrong people right? Because there's, uh, or you, if those really are your clients and your audience, then, then it's a really good wake up call that, you know what, what I had in mind, isn't going to serve the way that I thought it would, I need to make changes. Yeah. So, um, if I come out with a, if I'm thinking of a course that I want to pitch and I, and I talk to, you know, three of my ideal girlfriends that I think this would be perfect for. And if they give me feedback that that's not what they're looking for, then I need to, for me, then I drop it um, and and need to then get my head around creating something else. Um, so it's, but, but let's say you were talking to someone and it, and it wasn't resonating with them. I would first go see, think, okay, why is it, you know, are they too soon in their business, too late in their business, got something else going on? I might, I, I might reach out to a couple more different people um, that, that were in a different circumstance to see maybe it was resonating with them. Because yes. certainly, you know, on any given day, any one of us talking about any certain topic, it may be what we're interested in, it may not. And that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the, the topic, right? Just because your course isn't right for someone on a certain day doesn't mean necessarily it's the wrong course. But if your audience, if your ideal clients are giving your feedback saying, yeah, that's not really what, that's not a burning concern for me right now, then don't create it because um, you are just wasting time and money. Um, and I saw this in corporate and I see it with my individual clients now that everyone comes in thinking they know what the issue is and corporate spent, as you know, millions and millions of dollars solving issues that were never issues. Yes. Right? It's a training issue. Nope. It's not a training issue. It's a salary issue or it's a, you know, it's a, it's something else, but training is not going to fix this issue. Right. So, so I, so I think part of my job is to talk people out of bad training. Um, so if I can prevent you from spending lots of time and on money on something that's not going to work, I think that's a good thing. So hopefully this doing these interviews, you all will be validating your idea before you even jump in. And then the beta is a way to do a very low cost, low time commitment way to validate that idea on a little deeper level. Exactly. I think that's, that's such a great question. Um, and I think we have to be willing uh, throw the throw the baby out with the bathwater if you know we've we've put it out there and we're not getting that resonance and or um, it could be that a problem exists but the market isn't willing to pay for it right that's a possibility like it's not a painful enough problem that it, there just isn't a market for it so it may not be worth pursuing um, you may be catching someone at like a different point in the customer journey. Um, so you were catching them here, but you, but your problem actually is for people over here who are further along. Um, and again, the interviews will kind of help you, you suss that out a little bit. Um, and there was one, one thing that, uh, Dr. Susan had mentioned about, um, with teaching people to regulate their emotions at work, that's, that's definitely harder to make a standardized experience. How can I work with that? And then Dr. Barbara was mentioning case studies. So I think in Dr. Susan's case, you may need more um, video examples of people interacting, right? Like you may need to show um, 
case studies, uh, you know, show people acting out examples. Um, some of that might have to happen in person. Some of it might be you recording, like scripting it out and kind of recording some key scenarios. Like, let's take a look at what happens when like Billy gets angry at work and whatever, and like showing what that looks like. That might be, um, it might be a bit intensive for you on the exercise side of things to really show what those examples look like, but um, giving people just something to, to latch onto to see real practical examples, I think will make a lot of sense in your your scenario. And it also may be that, that like your ideas, I don't know what your idea is, but like maybe your idea is, you know, this, this, this long course or this, you know, multifaceted course. And it may be for the beta that you say, you know what, I'm just going to take one emotion and like anger or sadness or conflict, or I, I don't know what a small enough emotion, like you're just taking <laughs> one chapter or one module and saying, I'm going to run my beta on this one module. And maybe that one module can get your toehold in and can be the cornerstone then of the rest of the course. But I think for, for so beta is you either need to cut this way or cut this way, meaning that yes, eventually I'm going to have this whole, you know, 10 module course and it's going to be amazing. And it's going to be six months long and all of that, but you either need to go shallow or you need to go narrow. Um, and that might be that might um, help you because you're like, I don't want to create 500 different scenarios right now for all of that. But yes, I could create maybe five um, and, and maybe choosing one emotion or one cut of it might make it easier for you to get a toe hold and get traction on. I love that. And, and I think even. Um it might make sense to almost pitch them as workshops first, right? So if you have a sense that anger is the one that you want to focus on, you would come into the organization, you would do this, you know, workshop around anger, you're producing the course materials, and then that becomes something that you can then uh, sell to other organizations. But do you have a few organizations you could kind of run that workshop through first? Um, they don't need every single topic, right? If you're just starting with one workshop, it's already going to take them time to integrate what you're you're teaching them there. So give yourself time to build out that that course material starting. Absolutely. Out. And I also in the specificity also helps in everything. Like, for example, if I would think if you go to an HR and say, you know, let's talk about regulating emotions of your employees that doesn't resonate or, or that's kind of amorphous. But if you're like, I've got a workshop on anger management, then it's like, oh, my God, John was just in my office <laughs> and he was furious. Holy cow. Do I need this? <laughs> Does it, he it, need this? <laughs> exactly. Being specific helps yeah. all of us as learners and as marketers, because that then gives us something to latch on to. Um, so, so yes, being more specific, it, I mean, it's, it, you rarely get into trouble getting more specific and more targeted where lots of us <laughs> get into trouble most of the time is when we're kind of this amorphous general thing. You can't learn general stuff. You got to learn specific stuff. So, so the more specific we can be, the better. Love that. Dr. Susan's going to tattoo that on her arm. Um, yes. I saw Joanna Weeb give a really amazing talk all about specificity in your marketing. And um, you know, I she, love her. I love so her so great. much. <laughs> and just talking about even on your landing page, um, you know, she's like, your landing page is not for the average user. Forget the average user. Like you need to be so hyper specific that when someone reads that, they're like, oh, how did you know you're reading into my soul? Um, Joanna Weeb. She's a copywriter. Um, has, I mean, I'll, I'll find you guys some some um, case of her where uh, she's kind of a before and after of here's what happens when we got hyper specific with this product and look at the difference between the before and after. And you can really measure the difference in results when people just feel that. Resonance. And so she, I think she's a great example. Yeah. And she and, and, and look at how she teaches. Um, it's totally worth it. I'm on her list. She's amazing. Her stuff is amazing because I learn stuff from it. So other copywriters are saying, you get into the shoes of your learner or speak with emotion. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that doesn't get it. But yeah, then she shows me this before. And look, this was the sentence before. This is the sentence after. And here was the result. And I'm like, oh my God, I can totally use that today yeah. in the blog post I'm writing or something. It's yeah. she's just and look at the and look at the specificity that's driving that and look at how effective it is as a learning technique it's just yeah she's great i really want to see her speak in person oh, she's yeah can't say enough <laughs> good things about her um yeah and it's interesting right for a copywriter that her examples are quite visual right so she's found a way to kind of appeal 
uh, in a visual way. So it's not just about reading a, a giant dump of information. You're able to kind of follow along with this, this transformation. So I really like her sort of storytelling around results. Um, and yes, Helen, we are able to help. And I think all of us as a group can oh, help course, one yeah. another by saying what resonates and like if we get it or if we don't, right? Because I write all sorts of brilliant things that I send to my girlfriends and they're like, yeah, so. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's nice, Stacey. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I'm like, it was really brilliant in my head. Why do you not get this? But their feedback's invaluable to me. So, right, so before it hits actual people, I run it by my group. Um, and so I think this group, we can be that to one another, right? To say, okay, here's my, what do you think? Is it specific enough? Do you know who it is? Do you know the outcome? So we can say, oh, you know, I'm really not clear on why this is important or wow, no, I, I can't, it's not, I don't, you know, is this right for me? I mean, I should be your learner, but that doesn't really describe where I am or whatever it is. I think that we can all give that feedback to one another and immeasurably help one another in making sure that we're clear and specific um, and that that we've identified for the learners what, what to do and, and the benefit they'll get out of it. Exactly, Helen says. Uh, exactly. <laughs> we'll we'll exactly. tell you that you've got spinach That's the whole your... point. <laughs> But that's, and thank you for nailing that, Stacey. That's exactly what I want this group to be, is just that we can kind of offer that really honest perspective before we go out and, you know, ask those questions, do those interviews, invite people into our, our universe. So uh, that's awesome. Uh, I'll, I'll find uh, Joanna Weeb's information too, and I'll follow up with you guys, maybe. Um, um, yep, here, I've got it. Uh, copy, she's on Copy Hackers. Perfect. And I think um, she also yeah. recently launched Air Story, and I think she has a SaaS around copywriting too. I'm not, I'm not sure. That yeah, yep. But I think um, let's see. Can we? Um, is the, oh is it, yeah? Is this a course or is this her? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think Air Story. Oh, that's her. Oh, Copy Hackers could be her course. Mm. Um, how yeah? How do we get on her list? I don't know how I got on her list. Here, let me search in my email and see if that will help. Yeah, I'll round up a couple of my favorite articles of first two because I just I think okay. she's uh, she's pretty great. Um, Ooh, HubSpot. Let's see, Carl Weedian says she wants to work with career changers to help them design a life based on who they truly are. For the life of me, I don't know where to find career changes changers who want to live their best life possible. Um, so, Carlene, I'm curious how did you how did you identify that this problem existed? people in career change like I suspect in your case too you may you may need to get it more specific in order to find your people um, I made it up based on my story so um, is it sort of creating the course that you wish existed when you were going through a career change um, I know a friend of mine does fearless salary negotiation which is kind of interesting too. So he talks to people who either want to negotiate uh, an interview for new jobs or how do you actually move up the ladder in your current job, which is kind of an interesting um, course and angle. And Carlene, I think you bring up a really good point of, of successful courses are at that intersection between what we are passionate about and what we have deep expertise in and what the market needs and what people have a driving need for right and, and if you if there's if there's not that overlap it is brutal to sell and market your course and to get lead participants through it's just completely uphill all the way but when you can when you can nail when you can pitch it into that overlap you know it sells itself uh and not not to discount the work that you do to market and sell your course, Marie, which I know you do a great job at. But I also think you've so nailed the problems and the issues of where people are that that course really isn't hard to market. I mean, you know, you need to get people around it, but you don't have to convince people to take your course. It, 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 when the right people see that offer, they're like, yes, this is what I need. Sign me up. It's a, it's an easy course to market because you've so nailed that burning issue in the marketplace and right as we all know it's so much easier to you know sell an ice cream comb in los angeles during summer than it is in alaska in the middle of winter so let's just make life easier for ourselves and you know if, if i ever 
uh, when I have to advise people on, do I work on the course I'm really passionate about, my heart-centered course, or do I work on the course that people really want? Every time, I'm like, dude, go after what people want, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, which is not to say you should hate your course and hate your learners <laughs> and hate what you're doing. I don't mean that at all. But, but um, find what it is that people need and see how you how you want to serve that need. I mean, there's lots of things, and you're. I mean, there's lots of things that our clients have needs for that we choose not to do. Sure. And that's right. And that's fine. And I have no intention of, you know, my clients would love to see this or this from me. I'm not going to do it because it doesn't fit into how I want to run my business. Um, but 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 there's also things that they need and want that I'm like, you know what? Actually, that totally lines up with how I want to be. Yeah. And it, it reminds me of uh, I think it was Tara's Quiet Power Summit. Um, Charlie Gilkey, he said to a friend of mine um, who was having doubts about her course and kind of. I don't know, do I keep running this course? I'm not really passionate about it. I want to make this change over here. And he said, just because you can teach something doesn't mean you have any business doing it. So just because you can doesn't mean you need to, even if it is a fit. Sometimes it just may not make sense on a business capacity. So he was like, even if a market demand is there, it doesn't mean you have to you have to be the one to fill it. Yeah. Which I thought was a great, um, a great insight. But um so, uh, yeah, I don't know if this is so uh, I help people create online courses and I don't have an online course and I have no intention at the moment of having an online course, which is really weird, right? <laughs> like it would make much more sense as a marketing lead that I would have an online course. But that's not how I like to teach. I am a teacher at heart and I really love one-on-one -on -one intensives. Mm -hmm. So that's how I choose to, uh, to distill out my knowledge in that one-on-one -on -one live version. And that doesn't... It, you know, and I and I always think that's weird because people are always like, well, can I see a course? I'm like, well, you can see my clients' courses, but <laughs> I don't choose yeah. right now. I'm not because I really love that one-on-one -on -one version. Mm -hmm. So that's just how I'm choosing to run my business route. And I certainly could create an online course if I wanted to, but I don't want to. So and it and it hasn't. You know, I'm able to run my business fine without it. So yes, I think the. I, I, all of us here are multi-passionate, multi-skilled, I would imagine. There's a lot of things we could teach about and really narrowing down to what is it that our clients really need to hear from us and what is it that we really would want to teach. And so we're leaving a whole bunch of stuff out. But I think if we can get that overlap, that makes it easier for all of us. For sure. Um... Dr. Susan was offering some awesome advice, just saying she used to be a career coach. Um, and I was I was almost picturing, um, I for, I'm forgetting her name right now, but there's a girl who's, her positioning is sort of a guidance counselor for adults, which is, is kind of a cool niche. And I, I wonder if it's something along those lines. Um, and Dr. Susan was just saying, you know, is it people who've been laid off, people who um, left and are freaked out because they don't have a job? I really think you need to get more specific about what problems they're facing so you know what career changers you help. Everyone wants to live yeah, their best right. life deep down, you know, so I talk to people you've already helped, ask them what was happening. Um, people who've outgrown their careers, want to do something else, aiming for people over the age of 40, want a new lifestyle. Um, with a new line of work and Dr. Susan was saying I still get at the pain they're facing in terms of getting clear on what they want to do next so you can help alleviate that pain um, yeah it's Kath yeah Catherine Meisner is the one I was thinking that was the, the guidance counselor for adults yeah I think Carlene your challenge is going to be getting more specific and I, I would be curious what kind of clients you've been working with one-on-one -on -one and what kind of patterns you've been seeing um, and is there some almost like an ebook or an introduction or a guide to kind of get people, um, I don't know, with a really specific challenge. Don't have any clients yet. I had a free client last week. Okay. Awesome. Baby steps, baby steps. Um, yeah, I think, I think your challenge is going to be getting, getting more specific, um, which is tough, right? So it might be just, even with your free client, like testing the waters and just seeing what kind of questions um, they have and what kind of pains are common across people in these these career changes. Corporate women who wanted to, off the corporate track to do something more creative, but have all kinds of fears around that. Absolutely. Um, I have a, a friend that's doing a course on, you know, finding your creative voice for people that don't think they're creative, that have maybe always wanted to paint and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it might be tapping into something 
a little more specific, like, is it a desire for creativity? Is it a, a desire to be more brave? You know, what is it? Um, mark it around the fears. That's tricky. I don't necessarily have the answer, but I do think um, it's going to involve lots and lots of conversations, reaching out to people, uh, maybe looking at forums, right? Like something like Quora, you, you might find something like um, people looking for advice when they want to quit their job, right? So is it, you know, freelancer forums, people wanting to get into um, working for themselves, uh, travel story. <laughs> Yeah, it might be looking at, at people that are in um, even travel forums. Uh, I think Quora, Reddit, uh, um, what other sort of question based, any online forum stuff. Uh, and again, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look at the understand your learner stuff, but um, I think it's it's going to be good for you guys to just start opening opening up your feelers and uh I, I call it creeping you know it's <laughs> just really studying what people are talking about online when they're not um aware that they're being studied right it's like what are people actually talking about when they feel free to to ask questions and um just want insights there's so many amazing you know pain gold mines on quora and reddit um, if you do some digging, Reddit might actually be a good one for you as well. I know that there's uh, the Reddit rabbit hole goes deep and, <laughs> and you may have to, to edit yourself. But um, yeah, going on some career change. I mean, there's just so many incredible uh, threads on on Reddit that whether it's in the traveling, whether it's in uh, career change or corporate life or whatever that looks like, just looking for those pains. Um, I think it's. I think your challenge is going to be a research one primarily as you start having conversations with people. <laughs> Should I quit my job to travel? Bingo. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Like it could be getting really, really specific. Like, is it saving for your first trip? Is it, you know, how do you, how do you make it happen on a practical level? How easy is it to quit your job and travel? Amazing. It's, there's, I love the internet. There's such a gold mine of, Amazing. Yeah. So check the answers there. Um, are there any books in your field that kind of touch on these topics? Looking at Amazon reviews, looking at one in five star Amazon reviews um, can be really interesting and helpful. I think that's something Joanna Weeb talks a lot about. Uh, quit my job, flew to Paris. I had money. Hmm. So yeah, you, you might need to consider, are you talking to people that don't have any backup funds, right? Um, one way to test interest with this stuff too is writing some blog posts around this. So um, could you write a post about quitting your job and, and and just seeing what kind of response you get from your blog post? If you could send traffic to your blog and you don't really get any engagement or you don't really get any traction, there may not quite be a problem there or you might have an audience problem, right? Where you need to um, build some traffic. So. Uh, content marketing can be a great way to just test interest with some of these topics. Oh, and Marie, I wanted to mention um, the, the part of our conversation that we had yesterday of when y'all are working through this, can you mm -hmm. keep first versions of your stuff? Because uh, uh, we'd love to um, uh, look at that and, and help you out as it changes, um, but we also want to build case studies. Uh, for learners when they're going through the program next time or for marketing for Marie launching this course in the fall. Um, so so all of your work, we would love to see it. So when you're like, oh, I, I, you know, I filled it out and now it's completely different. Don't throw it away. Keep, you know, take a picture of it. Keep a copy yeah. of it. And even Somehow, for yourself, just to that. Yeah, because yeah, I, I, I'd really be interested in what that first version, that initial thoughts were around your course blueprint. And then eventually, you know, after you iterate it over a couple of weeks, what it's going to end up with. I'd love to keep um, th those pictures so we can compare them before and after and, and all of that. So if you could keep your work and keep your drafts, that would be super helpful. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's so good to, it's to so see, good how, to far see how, how far we come. We come. Um, Yes, and for right for for learners tracking your own work, um, I was telling my husband that like you know my workouts never get any easier. They're all you know it's they're still like dang this is hard. But and what I forget is, but I'm doing a lot more than I was able to do a year ago. But it doesn't feel that way. And learning is the same way that that we're like 
wow, because you know it's it, it's it doesn't get any easier; it just gets different. Um, and so it's gonna it's not gonna. So sometimes it doesn't emotionally feel like you're making progress, but when you can look back and say, oh, wait a minute, wait, like before I had no idea who my course was. Now I totally know what my course is, right? Documenting that just helps us as learners totally. emotionally. And I think we're all guilty too, at least I know I am, of like you set the goal and then you meet the goal, but then you've moved it to the next one. So you kind of forget that like, oh yeah, look how freaking far we've come. I know my income. I know I was like, I know I, I, yeah, I got an income goal and I like, you know, and then yeah, it moved and I'm like, I need my income goal. Exactly. My husband's like, but, but wait a minute. Yeah. So yeah, we do that. So all today great. and yay carlene i can't wait to read your blog post that's yes. awesome yeah and, and again post. share it in the group if share you guys if you guys uh you know post your blog post uh share it in the facebook group um uh share it with us because we can we can share it out we can you know help you edit it just give you feedback cheer you on that's what we're here for um so yeah you guys should all have access to understand your learners uh you might get freaked out as you're doing these interviews so don't hesitate to reach out in the facebook group if you guys need some extra support or suggestions or whatever um as you know this is my learning launch for this course material too so if there's anything that you guys need or you want um just more direction on any part of this i so so value your guys's feedback so um, Absolutely. And please, the, um, the, the more feedback, the more detailed and the more brutal, the better. <laughs> and if you don't want to send it to Marie, you can just send it to me and I'll filter it before it gets to Marie. <laughs> uh, but, but what's really, and you'll see as course designers, what's really helpful isn't, you know, I love module one and you know, we hope you love module one and I, you know, and I expect you, <laughs> I mean, but, but that's not as helpful as really the second exercise. I didn't see the value in it. And the third exercise, you know, I thought was useful, but I really was missing this piece of it. Um, I, and it wasn't until I finished it that I realized if you had positioned it this way, it would have been easier for me. That kind of stuff is gold. Yeah. So we would love any and all feedback coming in as what's working, what's not working, what's there and shouldn't be there, what's missing and should be there, right? Because this is a live beta that we're running um, to see what's working and not what's not working in the course. So just mm -hmm. Dump it on us, right? <laughs> all of it, all of it, all of it. Um, I can never get enough feedback. Um, and again, if you just want to send it, to, and you can send it to both of us. If you want to send it to me um, and ask me that I just anonymize it before I share it with Maria, I'd be happy to do that as well. Um, but yeah, as, as much feedback that you can give us about what works and doesn't work and what we should change will really, really help us. And um, and you'll see uh, um, you'll see as you're creating the course and then watching this course, you'll see um, how feedback can really um, help you as a course designer. And and I know remember when I talked about this at QPS, I was saying, okay, now we're going to ask for feedback, and everyone's like, oh my god, I don't want to ask for feedback. Like everyone shuts down, and no one wants yeah. feedback. But what I one of my goals is to make everyone love feedback. <laughs> right? Feedback is the gold, and can help you take a good course into a great one. Um, so feedback is really phenomenal, and it doesn't, it, it, you know, all of it you can use to, to to good stuff. So, and I want you all to be asking for feedback on your courses from your participants, and I want to show you a way to do that. Really Really easily and, and capture that and incorporate it but that is for another time awesome. so yeah so any more stuff thank you dr barbara that's awesome um yeah so that, okay making a see making a note on that that we're going to emphasize that more so in the documents than we did so yeah super helpful and you know how it always makes sense in your head and you put it out there and then someone <laughs> reads it and they got something totally different of it that's that's why this feedback is helpful like yeah. oh yeah i said that but i guess i forgot to emphasize that or something. So thank you. That's super helpful. Um, and someone was just asking for your um, email or the best way to reach out. To Absolutely. You. So, um, uh, what's the best way to get me? Cool. Amazing. Um, yeah. So if you guys have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out email, Facebook group. Uh, we're all in there. I'd love to just kind of see how you guys are getting on. If you get stuck at any of the modules, if you're just feeling even just resistance, 
I want to know. Let me know yeah. kind of where that stuff is is coming up for you guys, because um, I know that the perfectionistic stuff and and the imposter complex is a major part of this work. It, it brings up a lot of stuff. Um, so if you guys need any support on that, just say the word. And um, yeah, and it's not you, right? When, I mean, <laughs> any of us like you open module two, and Marie doesn't just, but right, you know, you open module one or two, and there's like four hundred things to do, and you're just like, dude, I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> out of this that's really good feedback to send to the course participant or the course creator right it's not you nobody is going to be able to do that so yeah so wherever you don't want to do the work can't do the work that's as valuable to us as saying you're oh my god i love the module you totally do the work right all that's really helpful and and we're all thinking that right you're just brave enough to tell it uh, yeah i just i'm i'm really passionate about the learning launch approach because i just think it, it gets people moving quicker and just not worrying so much about is this perfect? Is it ready? It doesn't matter if, if what you're doing is creating change for people. That's awesome, right? That's more important than, than a hidden course that doesn't create change for anybody, right? Yes, yes. And if, if can I just say um, one thing that, that um, let's just give ourselves permission that things are going to break, misspellings are going to go out, the, the little newsletter thing isn't going to get hooked up right, we're going to send it to the wrong people. Like all these things are going to happen and it's okay. Right, Marie's computer crashed right before this started. <laughs> exactly. It happens, right? So let's just have it be okay that things are not going to work out perfectly. We're going to have to ship that handout when we, you know, oh, but the graphics aren't right. Or maybe there's no graphics, right? That's all okay. This is our first test. This is a launch. It's a beta. Virginia. These things happen. Yeah. It does not mean we are bad people. It just means we're <laughs> you know, forward and doing the very best that we can mm -hmm. in and among all the other things going on in our life. Mm -hmm. And it's good enough, right? All of it is good enough. And whatever mistakes or problems are all, we'll fix it in the next launch. Yeah. And there is um, a future topic where we get into um, the whole idea of the beta invite being this exclusive thing. And so those are the people that they don't care if it's imperfect. And most of the time, nobody knows. They have no idea what you had planned for them anyway. So as long as you're getting people moving, <laughs> That's all that, that matters. So um, awesome. Yeah. Oh, and here, this is one of my favorite. Don't come back. I'll have it. Um, this is oh, one of my favorite starts. Okay, now there's swearing in here. So, <laughs> right. Okay. So there, but uh, but this is one of my most, most favorite starts when I get stuck in perfectionism, which happens. Okay. I'm like a week and a half late on a blog post because I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> perfectionist demons. Um, so, this is what I watch to get myself over that. Um, so my, my favorite line is, you know, perfectionist is an perfectionism is an asshole who shows up to your party or something. <laughs> Love it. But anyway, so that's the Frank's talk on an indication for beginners. And I think it's just so sets the frame of like, look, our job is to get moving. It's OK. It's not perfect. Yep. Yeah. And, and my hope, too, with the pacing of everything is that it feels doable and that in most cases, you guys have most of what you need to, need to get this thing launched this summer. And if you don't, if you don't it's, it's, it's probably way too big. So. Yes. Oh, that's right. Yes. So, so the other reason Marie specifically designed this in short time and everyone's going to say, but oh my God, I don't have enough time. You do. We're forcing you to think smaller <laughs> because we're looking out for your learners. Your learners do not want 400 modules, right? So we're standing in for your learners. We're forcing you to go small um, because it serves you and it serves your learners as well. So yes. So if it's, if you can't get it done in time, it's too big and you need to think smaller. And in in the end, that's going to be a gift, even though in the middle of it, it bites and it sucks and it's horrible. Awesome. That's so good. Um, so, OK, well, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for, for sticking on this long. And um, we're going to do um, two weeks from today, same time. And he asked, can I balance bringing on the new program while translating my... Of course. Yeah, I think, um, Emmy, in your case, you know, a lot of yours might be some copying and pasting and kind of, you know, um, it should be pretty straightforward to get your existing program on to Doki. Um, and so, yeah, you'll be going through most of the exercises with your new course in mind, it sounds like. So absolutely. Um, and again, if you need any help doing that, uh, whether it's Doki specific questions or otherwise, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. So thank you guys so much for participating. Um, I'm really excited to watch all of your ideas come to fruition this summer. And thank you again, Stacey. Yeah, my pleasure. I can't wait to see you guys in the Facebook group. Woohoo! Take care, Yay. guys. Okay, bye, y'all. <laughs> bye for now.